Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Cynthia Garcia and I'm a first year at the college studying social studies and economics and I'm a member of the JFK Jr. Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exits on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the unlikely event, in the unlikely event of an emergency, please go to the exit closest to you and congregate at the JFK Park. With that being said, um, please silence your cell phones and welcome me in giving a warm welcome to Praveen Kumar. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Praveen Kumar, and I'm a sophomore at the college, as well as a member of the Forum Committee. To say that this upcoming election is monumental might be an understatement. 71% of Americans believe that, on issues that matter to them, their party has been losing more than winning. This election will undoubtedly determine our policy stances for years to come on key issues such as the economy, abortion, our southern border, and foreign policy, just to name a few. 2024 is also the year of elections. Over 4 billion people in over 50 countries are expected to cast their ballots in a year that's crucial for worldwide stability and democracy. In the US alone, the presidency, the House of Representatives, and 33 Senate seats are all up for grabs. Now many of us are wondering the same questions. Which races are the most important and hotly cont contested? Which issues will influence and sway independent voters? How will our government structure be impacted by the results of this election? To provide us some perspective on the upcoming election and the future of our country, we have with us today an experienced guest. Former Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, presided over the 118th Congress from January to October of last year. He served two terms as a member of the California State Assembly before being elected to the House. He served as the U.S. Representative for California's 20th District from 2007 to 2023 and the House Minority Leader from 2019 to 2023 before becoming Speaker. This discussion will be moderated by Douglas Dillon Professor of Government, Graham Allison. Professor Allison received the Defense Department's highest civilian honor, the Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service for reshaping relations with Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan to reduce the former Soviet's nuclear arsenal. We would like to thank the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming former Speaker McCarthy and Professor Allison. So it's a great honor to welcome tonight to Harvard's John F. Kennedy Forum, uh, former speaker Kevin McCarthy, uh, somebody whom I got by chance to know last year uh, in the context of uh, the visit of the Thai, of the Taiwanese president, uh, which he was determined to manage more successfully than his predecessor had done uh, in an earlier venture. And, uh, in the course of that, I came to learn more about him and to admire him. So uh, he and I have been back and forth for, uh, I think, a year trying to find a date for this since his schedule has been a little busy. But we're very, very, very glad to have him here today. And I think for the topics uh, on the table, as has been introduced, the 24 election, uh, Donald Trump, the future of American democracy. We could, could not have somebody who's more in the middle of this. Most of you know I'm a, a great uh, student and admirer of uh, what Teddy Roosevelt called the, the men, the men and women in the arena. Uh, John Kennedy, for whom this school is named, had a great version of it. We could almost see here in this uh, thing. He said, uh, bullfight, cr bullfight critics row on row crowd the enormous Palace de Toro, but only one there is that knows, and he's the one that fights the bull. So Kevin has been in the ring, <laughs> has been fighting for a long time, uh, and has a, many chapters of a career to follow. So before I 
frame the big picture, I thought we would start, we agreed with a little, almost like speed dating back and forth, or in the Rubenstein tradition for, for just to get to know each other. So how could a nice young man from Bakersfield, California, uh, whose father was a assistant uh, police, or uh, fire, fire uh, chief, and who aspired to be a first responder, end up in the middle of the arena? Uh, well, first of all, you got an amazing man here in Graham Allison. He's an asset to America. And we've been trying to do this for a year. Um, I'd wait till I got fired, so now I don't have a job, so I got more time <laughs> on my hands. And um, my only way to get to Harvard was to be speaker, and you wouldn't let me in by my grades. So congratulations to all you. You're much further ahead than I ever would be able to be. Um, so I, I grew up in a town called Bakersfield, California. It's 90 miles north of LA. It's the Central Valley. It is um, agriculture, energy, oil, and uh, renewables, and, and aerospace. Um, my family are all Democrats. I happen to be a Republican. Uh, my family didn't have wealth, and I didn't have grades that great, so when I got out of high school, I went to community college. And they instilled in me a work ethic. Um, now, you could figure out how I met this man. He owned a liquor store, and he sold me beer underage, but he, he had a car dealer's license. And I talked to him one time. I said, if I gave you 100 bucks, would you take me to the L.A. car auctions? What happens is dealers get these trade-ins, but you have to be a dealer and at the big fairgrounds. They would bring these all in, and, and dealers come in and buy them for their lots. So he would take me there, and I would buy and sell cars, and I would flip them to pay my way through college. Now, it's illegal, but I didn't know it why I was doing it. Okay, so not for that premise. And when you go to community college, you go visit your friends who are away at college. My best friend was running back up at Stanford. I had some friends at SC, and I had some friends at San Diego State. So this weekend, I was going to go to San Diego State to visit some buddies. So I go pick up my friend, and we go to the grocery store so I could cash a check, so I could have some money for the weekend. It's a Friday night. The day before, California just started the lottery. So what did I do when I cashed a check? I bought a lottery ticket and I won the lottery. True story. I won the first winners in California. Now, this was scratch off. This wasn't millions. The most was $5,000. But put yourself in my place. This is before you were born. It's 1985. You're 20 years old. It's Friday night. You just won $5,000 when $5,000 meant something. And you're going to spend the weekend 10 minutes from Tijuana. <laughs> okay. So I come back, no cell phones back then, so I could run for office later, but um, <laughs> just joking. I take my folks to dinner, nicest place, brother orders dessert to make the price higher. I give my brother and sister each 100 bucks, and I take the majority of the rest of the money. There's some things you learn about. I love to take risk. I put the majority of the rest of the money in one stock. I do pretty well. I make 30% of my money in six weeks. So the end of the semester comes, I decide I'm going to take a break. I refinance on my car, I sell my stock, and I go and I try to buy a franchise. But no one will sell me a franchise. I'm trying to buy a, a subway. But no one will sell me one because I'm 20 years old. Another thing about me is I never give up. So I go and I open my own deli. I build the counter literally in my dad's garage. Three lessons I learned. First to work, last to leave, last to be paid. But I do really well. So at the end of about two years, I now have enough money that I could pay my way through college and I wouldn't have to work as long as I went to Cal State and no one in my family at this moment had finished a four year degree. So I sell my business, I'm going to college, I open up the local paper, it says be a summer intern in Washington DC with my local congressman. I do not know this man, but I thought he'd be really lucky to have me. So I applied. You know what he did? He turned me down. But you wanna know the end of the story? I got elected to the seat, I couldn't get an internship, I ended up to being the 55th speaker of the house. Only in America could that happen, right? I went back to this guy when he gave me a nice turn down letter. And I said, you don't need to pay me. I don't need to go to DC. I just want to volunteer. He said, I'll let you do it for a month. I did it for a month. When the month came, he said, I'll let you stay, but I can only give you 100 bucks. Fine, I don't need money. And that's what got me started. And um, I didn't think I would end up in politics. I thought I'd end up in business. Um, as Graham talks, I was leader for the last five years. It wasn't a, an easy five years for my party. We lost the White House. We lost both cycles in the Senate. We lost governors, we lost legislators, but you know what, where we won? We never lost in the House. I'm the first leader who never lost. Every cycle we won. But you know one of the things I'm most proud of? It's how we won. 
the Republican Party had elected the most women and the most minority Republicans in the history of America in the last two cycles. And I didn't do it in red states. When I became leader, Nancy Pelosi became speaker. In those four years, picked up five seats in California, never lost one. Picked up five more in New York, one Oregon, one Arizona. In the places Republicans were losing, we were winning. The quality of the candidate matters. And what I really viewed, and I'll end with this, the, the turning point for me, and I shared with some others, I became leader after um, the election, what was it, 2018, we got wiped out. So I become minority leader. We go in January, have the State of the Union, and the State of the Union's pretty dramatic. The Democrats had a, had a great election that year. They, they elected a lot of new people. And at State of the Union, both sides like to stand up, right? They wear certain clothes, so they show up on TV. And I remember being there as leader, excited about it, and I look over and the Democrats stand up, and there were a lot of them. But they looked like America, different ages, different walks of life, and then we stand up, and we look like a really restrictive country club in America. And I thought to myself, I'm either gonna be the leader of declining party, or I'm gonna to have to open this place up. And uh, if there's different legacies in it, I'm proud of what we were able to do during that short time. So. Okay, so uh, here's a chance to recruit a few more uh, Republicans and a few more they folks might who might run yet. for Maybe Congress. How, how, what, what's the short pitch for why a student in the college or in the Kennedy School today should become a Republican and the second related and run for office. All right. I don't care what party you're in, I want you to participate. Um, the other thing I ask you, um, know your why. I would recruit people to run, I never ask them to run, I ask them why they want to, okay? Why am I a Republican when I grew up in a family of all Democrats? I love my parents, I love my family, I respect them. Whatever party you are and whatever belief you have, respect that but respect somebody else because what they come from it is their knowledge. I came to this party based upon a few people and philosophies, okay? A party's bigger than a person. But the first Republican president is Abraham Lincoln. And I love how the party was created. I love what Lincoln said at Gettysburg Address. Four score and seven years ago, our, four, our, our nation, <laughs> four score and seven years ago, on this continent, a new nation was conceived. Conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all of us are equal. He go, goes on to say, but if we fail, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from earth. Not being the world power, but understanding that America's power is stronger than an aircraft carrier. It's all of us. The other thing is there's not one other nation in the world that's conceived in liberty and dedicated that everybody's equal. It doesn't mean we're perfect. We strive for a more perfect union. And so and I look at Teddy Roosevelt and I look at Ronald Reagan. Um, that's the foundation. I want to have a limited government, but I want that government to be efficient, effective, and accountable. I want to be able to take risk, I want to be able to fail, and I want to be able to reap those benefits at the same time too. And I, I don't want government so far in my life. Okay, so let me go off in a different direction for just a second. So you've lived through a pretty remarkable period in the House. You've had now a number of people actually resigning from the house before their term is out, saying this is such a mad house, I'm just getting the hell out of here, like we were talking about Mike Gallagher. And uh, you have a book like Romney's, uh, basically uh, saying uh, this whole business is kind of uh, smells. Uh, so I, I think the, uh, uh, tell us about one or two of the more bizarre uh, experiences in, in this job. I, you know, in the uh, in your uh, eventual ouster as as uh, as speaker, uh, another congressman Gates, uh, if, if, I, if I can understand it, uh, was trying to do a deal with you to bury some sexual misconduct for his support. It sounded to me a little bit like blackmail. So, what are what's a couple of of bizarre experiences that you're prepared to share? 
I, I will tell you this. I served 17 years in the House. People would look at, anybody watch me trying to win speaker the first time? 15 rounds, right? Pretty good. Um, chaotic. I loved every minute. Bigger the challenge, great. Becoming speaker, then each week, the press would start on Monday, or you're going to get thrown out. On Tuesday, you can't pass the bill. On Wednesday, but, and then we'd pass it. Went through the debt ceiling with the president. I mean, um, I like a challenge. Um, I didn't get, I didn't, ending of speaker, I'd do it all again. Is it based upon eight people joining all the other party and driven by one person because he's got an ethics complaint that happened four years ago because he paid to sleep with some underage woman? Yeah. But I, I am not going to break the law and change some ethics complaint. I think history will be kind to me. I was at Georgetown last night, and they said the approval of Congress has dropped. I said, yeah, because I'm no longer there, right? No. <laughs> um, this is the one thing I'd like to say to everybody. One of the problems we have is people on both sides of the aisle run for Congress by tearing it down. We run by saying government's bad. I want limited government, but I want the very best people to serve. We no longer get news, we get opinion. And we, we, we gather it in the opinion we already believe. And we don't have two parties anymore. We, we have three or four parties within each party. You know, for the Republicans, Fox is too liberal, we gotta go to Newsmax, or NBC, or CNN, and then you go to MSNBC. And I, I just watched one network hire a former party chair, and then their own people said no, because they didn't agree 100% what I did. I mean, that's not right. And, and, and in today's society, you know, in, in the world of business, People make agreements, right? And they say both sides can win. In today's world, we think only one side should win, and you've got to like almost destroy the other side. But the thing we have to sit back and remember, our government is designed that you have to have compromise. Both sides can win and walk out of it. And you know what happens when that happens? America wins. Now, earlier we had a conversation like Mitt Romney, Manchin, and cinema aren't running again. I like all of them. Cinema and I, we, we work out together. She's, she's really sharp. And, it, and if, if you say, who are the most bipartisan people in the Senate, you'd say those three. But you would look at me and say, how bad Congress is that those three aren't running again? Well, why aren't they running again? Because they can't win. So I wouldn't look inward. I would look out to America. If these three people are the most bipartisan, We'd have to look at ourselves and say, then we're really not celebrating that. We're not rewarding that. Because they should be able to run for re-election and not be challenged. But they can't win in their primaries to get to the general. And look, I, I, I have this philosophy. Um, the Senate is like a country club and the House is eating at a truck stop. All right? It's the way the founders designed it, right? We're up every two years, they're up every six years, we're revolutionary, we're more, re we're more, our districts are smaller, we're closer to the people, we should reflect what the people think, right? And the Senate's supposed to kind of calm us down, right? It takes a little longer. Um, this election, or I would say in the last two presidential elections, we did not go as a country and vote for who we wanted to be president, we voted against who we didn't want to be. If you elect your leader that direction, you give that person no mandate to carry out. Presidential elections should be aspirational. It should be, what should the future look for? Like? And we're also bogged down, like someone was giving a poll number earlier, 70% of America is not happy with who our nominees are. But we picked them. But I also think America is going through something that we're sitting at the Kennedy Center. In the 1960s, America made a decision that we started electing our leaders in their 40s. Well, now, I, I was just at an event the other night where President Bush was at, and I think of Bush and Gore. And they'll both tell you they're too old to be president, and they're both younger than our two nominees. And so, reflectively, I try to talk to people. Yes, elected officials have a big responsibility, but we're electing them. And we shouldn't put it all upon them. Of the people, for the people, but shall not perish. We need to engage in a different manner. 
but I'd hope our engagement would respect one another's opinion because it's based upon our own life experience why we come to this. And maybe you haven't had that experience then. And it, that's, a, that's a walk and a time. And also from an approach that most of the bills we vote on, we vote pretty much bipartisan. Votes pass a lot with 300. We only, we only reflect or our, our spend time on where we divide. And any time we come to an agreement, one side tries to sell, they won this way, I try to sell, I won that way. One thing, yeah, they won certain things, we won certain things, because that's how government's designed to play. So let me pick us up to the three big topics which you've already got us on to. So we have 2024 mm -hmm. and what the hell is going on. And we have Trump and the future of the Republican Party. And we have the future of American democracy. So I want to go drill down on each of those. So you already started us on uh, the 24 election. So polls show if we had the election today, pretty much a flip, a flip of the coin. So, little bit of advantage for for Trump but again seven months away politics is a long time so uncertain but in any case the fact as you referred to the and the introducer two-thirds of the people don't like the choice so uh, as uh, former IOP fellow Susan Milligan put it uh, welcome to the 24 election may the least unpopular candidate win so uh, I mean, this both says something about the 24 election, about the likely enthusiasm of students as they're coming into their political consciousness and their role, and their notion about how the system's working. If the system, uh, which is working in the way that it currently works, serves up to you two candidates, and your only question is which one you dislike more, that doesn't quite seem like a healthy political system. So tell us how you're seeing the 2024 election in that context. Okay, can I, can I answer this question as kind of a political scientist? Just give you data to what I think would happen today. And I'd use you as a focus group if you'd be willing to do that. Sure. Okay, will you want to do this? Okay, I'm not going to ask you who you're going to vote for. Take that out of your mind. I want you to think, if you had to bet, who would win? Not who you want to win, not who you're going to vote for, but who you think is going to win. How many people here think Joe Biden, if the election was today, is going to win re-election? So raise your hands. Raise your hands. Okay. We're done. How many people here, again, I say this as, it's not who you're going to vote for, not who you want to win, who you think is going to bet money. If you were to bet money on election today, how many you think President Trump would win? Now, would it be fair to me if I asked a simple question? I won't do that to you. How many people that here would vote for President Trump that arms would be lower than that that rose to hand? Now, if I look at the last election between these two men, President Biden won the election by 48,918 votes. His favorability rating was plus 10, and Trump is exactly in the polls where he was in the last election. But Joe Biden's favorability rating today is minus 20. So I kind of disagree with Graham. If the election was today, it wouldn't be as close, and I think President Trump would win, sheerly on data. The Senate would flip. The Senate is different than the House, okay? The Senate is not all up at once. It is an advantage to Republicans this cycle. The states that they're playing in, that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. The Senate could have, Republicans should have won it the last two cycles. They lost both of those elections. But I think they win this one. They've got an advantage. Why? Mansion's gone. You only have to pick up one. I think we pick up West Virginia. It's trending that way. I think uh, Hogan running in Maryland changes the course. It's a chess game. Demo Democrats are going to have to spend a lot of money there. And Hogan has proven being a two-term governor. And he's, he's not viewed as Trump. Um, I'll give you one statistic data, too. In, I was leader, and it's the last time it was a presidential election. 
and Joe Biden wins with 82 million votes, right? That should be a great night for Democrats, would it not be? How many, Dem how many Republicans did Democrats beat in the House that year? Anybody? Zero. It was the first time since 1994 not one Republican incumbent lost in the House. But every per if you paid the Cook Report, and I would always argue with them, thousand they would have yeah. told you we would lose 13 seats. Yep. They got the number right, the party wrong. Now, I went in that election night thinking I wasn't going to pick up seats too, but when I walked out, I knew it all along. I'm just joking, but I said that. Um, because Trump also drives turnout on both parties. But where do you drive it? I believe it's easier in the House, despite the chaos that is happening right now with Republicans, they can actually pick up seats in the House. Why? They didn't redistrict New York like they thought they would. They picked up one seat. They didn't get Wisconsin, they said no. In North Carolina, they did redistrict, and three Democrat incumbents aren't even running for re-election because they don't have a chance to win, and they could pick up another fourth. Alabama redistrict benefited to the Democrats, and Louisiana, but there's a court case right now that could decide next week that that gets flipped back. So it's actually easier for Republicans to pick up seats in the House this next election than it would be for the last two. Regardless of what comes out, the House, based upon the redistricting, is no one's going to have a 240 seat. It's still going to be close both ways. Um, that's from a political science point of view. Now, that is if the election was today. It can shift a lot of different ways. I don't think it's six swing states. I think they, the Democrats have Nevada, and I think we have Georgia. I do think Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. I do think there's going to be three main issues, OK? Democrats are going to run hard on abortion because it is going to be effective. Maybe not so as effective as the last election. But Arizona Supreme Court just made a decision it's going to be an issue in Arizona. And there are initiatives that are put on the ballot. And what that happens, kind of like if you did a marijuana initiative, it draws people out who are not before. But if I look at the enthusiasm right now, Biden has a problem. Young people are not there for him. He doesn't have the same coalition that has come together for Democrats in the past at the same percentage when it comes to black Americans or Hispanics. Um, when an election is, is wide open for president, it's aspirational. When, it, when you're running for reelect, it's more a report card on yourself. The border is a bigger issue than anybody can think of. We're sitting in Massachusetts, right? How many Republicans does Massachusetts send to Congress? Zero. I have tried every year to win here. One time I thought, the best I ever did was Barney Frank. I was on his committee. He's a very smart man, and he is a heck of a politician. But I funded a race, not knowing, thinking I could win, but a game of chess. Barney is the chairman of financial service. He raises all these millions of dollars. And he literally had to go to his own bank and borrow a quarter million dollars for his own race. So that let me pick up some other seats in other places. But do you know what your governor has, has a state of emergency on in Massachusetts? The southern border. New York, number one issue. And the problem being is Biden owns this issue. If he doesn't do something about it, I don't know. And from a basis, there's a number of Sub-issues, fentanyl, comes from China, yep. comes from there. Number one killer of Americans between the ages of 18, 18 and 40. Now, the thing I want you to think about, and this is another discussion I have with him, why would another country want to target that age group? Think about the ages of 18 to 40. It's the years you reproduce. It's your most productive years in business. It's the age group that volunteers to serve in your military. It is a damaging group, age group to start losing in the country. The number of pair on the terrorist watch list. Let me give you one fact. Last February, the only reason I don't give it this year, I don't have the latest numbers. To get on the terrorist watch list is very difficult. And these are just people we have caught, not people that we didn't catch. We caught more people in last year in the month of February on the terrorist watch list in one month than we caught in the entire last four years. And it has shifted a lot of people. 
The Democrats used to think they'd win all the Rio Grande. This is heavy Hispanic. They think because of the border and all that. Republicans now win that area based upon this issue. But it's not just that issue. If New York is not the border with Canada they're worried about here. The, the next issue is the economy and inflation. You just saw the numbers today. I think the Democrats were really hoping that would go down. So they're going to run, if, if I'm going to judge on how they're going to run a race, Biden is going to try to run the same campaign he ran before. No disrespect here. Biden is not Obama. He can't put the coalition that I think of everybody together. And Biden is not the same Biden I knew 20 years ago. He does one big event a month. And there is an underlying issue about both candidates, but more so with Biden, his age. He gets asked about it. He gets shown when he falls, right? And he gets upset when people say something, so he puts an event together, and then he goes out and he stumbles. So he doesn't get the message he's trying to produce. He doesn't get the message he's trying to produce. He, it falls back on the report there. So that's a hard thing to overcome. So he's going to run a race about anti-Trump. That drew people out, and he was able to win last time. But Trump was the, the candidate, Trump was the president at the time, so it was a report card on him. So that's going to be a little more difficulty. Trump also has the court cases. So he's going to have to still go through that. Biden has more money, a lot more money. But you can make some of that up. There's going to be a lot of money played, but there's another internal issue within the Democratic Party, and that's Israel and Gaza. And when you're talking about Michigan and Wisconsin and only winning those by less than 100,000 votes, that can be a real difficulty. Okay. So this is a, I, mean, I think we got a political science uh, class, fantastic, I'd say, as an analysis of the dimensions of it. Very, very helpful. I've got some notes here. I have to try to tr absorb them. Let me pick it up to the, to the next level, though, about what this says about our democracy. Uh, so as was suggested in the introduction, I mean, when you look at polls about citizens' views of our democracy, they're depressing. So confidence in major government institutions, an all-time low. 26% of people say they have confidence in our presidency, in the, in the Congress, in the, in the Supreme Court. That's 10 points lower than 2020. Uh, satisfaction with democracy, all-time low, 28% this year, down from 60% in the 90s. 53% uh, of Americans think the American political system cannot address the nation's problems. And 42% think having a strong leader is more important than having a democracy. So now if I go to Trump and Biden, mm -hmm. Trump says about the election, this is a, you know, democracy's on the ballot. Actually, there's only one thing, at least one thing Trump and Biden agree about completely, which is that if the other's elected, that's the end of the American democracy. So Trump says, I don't think we're going to have another election in this country if I don't win. And Biden says, democracy is on the ballot. The alternative to democracy is dictatorship. So we're going to see a lot more rhetoric in this space. But for Americans, I mean, the, the idea that they don't believe in our system of government uh, probably is not a good sign for our future of a democracy. That's true. And th this is a big question. And, and if you, because you have many smart people here, if you start studying the trust in government, when did it start clicking down? The Pentagon Papers. And then there was other things added to it. The tough part here about democracy is this goes to our news today. And, and people ask, do, does Russia try to influence our elections? Yes, all the time. Do they try to pick and make one candidate win? No. They want us to fight with each other. And they want to destroy our belief in our government and a belief in our system and a belief in our elections, okay? Compounded on that, we as candidates run downgrading the jobs we even want. Ah, oh, Washington is terrible, right? But if I say, are we worried about democracy, and I go into a group of Democrats, they're going to say, I'm 
worried about democracy. And the first thing that's going to come to mind January 6th. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't agree with anything that happened on January 6th. I got evacuated when they're breaking my uh, window, everything about it. But if you go to a Republican group and you say, do you care about democracy? Yes, I care about democracy. You can't trust these elections. They steal them. And they're going to say, do you see what's happening today? I've never seen it in America. They took our nominee off the ballot in Colorado, and we had to go to the Supreme Court to try to keep it. How can you use government to do that? And now they're putting him in court, going on these cases, trying to draw him up, just so he can't be the nominee. So both parties are really afraid of what a democracy, but they think totally different the way they look at it. And they can't understand why the other side doesn't see what they're seeing. But wouldn't you think there's some truth in both? And so what you're having is you're watching also the news, you're getting an opinion that's driving you more on yours and just seeing on the others. I will tell you, but you also don't pause and think back. Everything accumulates on itself. So yeah, you can yell at Republicans about what happened in the last election, but you can go all the way back to the hanging chad in Florida, who went to the Supreme Court. You can go back to the 2016 election where Hillary said it was stolen. Jimmy Carter said it was stolen. You could see Joe Biden said the same thing. The Democratic leader, Hakeem, said numerous times. But it's not emphasized as much, but on the other party they emphasize it, right? So when Democrats hear Trump say something, they only view that and they get very mad at what he says. Then when we look at what happened in Georgia, Stacey Abrams, these all have accumulated upon themselves. And I think collectively, you are never going to trust democracy unless you trust the election. And what's scary to me is, I was just with a highly educated, very smart doctor. And the number one question he had was, I'm really worried about the trust in this election, whether it gets stolen. And so, if you don't trust at the end of the day the accountability, I believe we have changed. In, and the, one other compound in here that we don't think about, the last presidential election happened during COVID. So there were election laws that were changed that were different than you had before. So people have personal experiences where they see, if you were in California, everybody got mailed a ballot. But if you lived in California the last few years, a lot of people have left. So in your house, they don't clean up the rolls. Like in LA, there's 1.2 million people on the rolls of LA who aren't even, who, who, that's 1.2 million more people than are actually old enough to be registered in LA because they haven't cleaned up the rolls. So at your house, you will get four or five families who have lived in your house sometime before, and you're thinking, oh my God, you just smell the bell. This is how people cheat. And, but they don't check that when it goes in there, they check whether the signature, they check whether it's before. There is a balance, a check and balance here. And I think we've got to emphasize that more collectively by both parties. So at the end of the day, whoever wins, we start the trust to come back. And one of the interesting features of that, which you and I talked about once before. So you have these, uh, each state has its own uh, secretary who manages the electoral process. The Kennedy School actually has had some a support effort with them looking at the cyber risks last time. And uh, at least from the ones that I've seen, including the fellow in Georgia, uh, these are upstanding citizens who are doing this because they're trying to do a good job. As you say, there was a lot of things disturbed by COVID with some changes in the thing. But I think the fact that you have this among 50 states and you have quite a serious effort being undertaken leaves me with a reasonable degree of confidence in the outcome for, if I try to assess it when I listen to the claims about well you can't really you're not the candidate I'm trying to convince I mean I, I think if there's more sunshine I can walk out of a meeting and I could look at a news report about it and there'll be a conspiracy theory of what happened in that meeting to the people who weren't in it uh, so you've got to go after the people who don't trust it. Let them see the system to go through and let them understand it. So, and if there's a place that you think there's a weakness, it's not 
it's really not going to be the Secretary of State who cheats. It's going to be somebody out there that's so passionate about their candidate who's going to steal a bunch of ballots, and that's where. How do you catch that process? And I think the, so being absolutely as uh, alert and yeah. as thorough as we can about that, and making it possible if there, if something's going on both at the accounting level, people when sit you there. It, yeah. So everybody sees the same. Okay, we're going to go to the audience here after one more question. There are microphones on the floor and in the loge, and I can't tell on the balcony here. Uh, you stand up, and we're going to give you a chance to uh, introduce yourself. A uh, question is short, ends with a, que with a question mark. I think we have more than enough questions. Maybe I've already done enough of my own, so we'll start with this gentleman, please. Thank you, um, and thank you, Speaker, for coming. Uh, Dwight Hutchins, uh, mid-career, 96, Dean's Council now. Um, the Congresswoman that re uh, represents my district is Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. um, Where's the district? Georgia. Rome, Georgia. <laughs> uh, and in the last election, Herschel Walker ran. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't hear a lot of policy. I didn't hear a lot of measured arguments. And you just mentioned the, the, the man from Florida that you had a beef with. I mean, the, it doesn't okay, feel like- I don't have a beef with him. He had one with me. Okay, yes. <laughs> um, but the, so the question is, when it feels like it's just all for performance and for the television, and when it's not about governing, and if it's, when it's not about actually accomplishing anything, what does it say about our people, our, the, the people who are voting from them? I don't blame them. They're just doing what works. Well, why does it work? Yeah. Why do you run negative ads? They work, right? You drive, you do. If you can't win on your merit, you try to drive the negatives on your opponents lower than yours so you can win. Um, it's kind of what I talked before about the different news agencies, social media, and others. Um, also, sometime in Congress, you, you're, you're drawn into a race that's one party's going to win, and it's all the primary, so you're going further the other way. Um, why does one product sell more than the other? What sells, people will do more of. If it didn't work and you didn't win elections, you wouldn't do it. Um, and, you know, it goes back, Nixon said, you know, you run to the right in the primary and you come to the center in the general. So you got your primary and your generals. Uh, you, you mentioned Marjorie, and I'll tell you this. When I first came in, Marjorie was um, very opposed. And, an interesting thing, when I would sit down with all these CEOs and they'd get mad, like, why can't you make all this happen? And I'd tell them, look, you get to hire and fire who works with you. Somebody else hires and fires who works with me. I just have to try to inspire them, okay? I found Marjorie, though, for probably what you believe of her, is much different when you met her in person. It's almost, when I sat and gave her more information on that, she voted for the debt ceiling. She supported me for speaker at the beginning when she thought. People come into office with certain experiences, and that doesn't mean they have all this other information. What I try to do is provide everybody as much information as possible, and then you can come to your conclusion. I find that she's a much better legislator than America views of her, and I just don't. And I see that on Democrats on the other side, too, because what happens is parties pick people and try to demonize them. But I will say this, uh, Marjorie's never been a, elected to anything before. She came to Congress. She's only maybe in her second or third term, and most of America knows who she is by an acronym. Same thing when it would come to AOC. I wouldn't underestimate a person like that. They're more of a movement politician than something else. Our problem is, for both parties, is we haven't been solving problems. We're fighting over small stuff, so we're missing the big picture for the future. We have different parties within our own parties. We have a populist movement. Um, I tell my children growing up, never make a decision out of emotion. Things should be decided out of principles. When you go to populism, there's not a principle behind that. And my, my philosophy in life is there's two types of leaders. You're a thermometer or a thermostat, OK? A thermometer does one thing, tells you the temperature. There's a lot of leaders like that. A thermostat will not only tell you the temperature, but will change it. You'll be, discom you'll be discomfort in him, that he or she changing it, 
But that's a leader that's going to make a tough decision to sustain themselves. It's going to take you a while to get temperature down, and you're going to do things that are uncomfortable. But when you finally get there, you're going to say, yeah, I'm glad they did that. But during the moment, if you could just vote them out, you're going to vote them out. It's a great, uh, a great line to remember, the thermostats and the thermometers. I, I have a version of it, uh, sort of energy sources and transmitters and grounds. Yeah, so I do it in, in three categories. <laughs> Lady in the lows, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I kind of wanted to uh, ask about the statements you made earlier about how uh, Republicans have been um, winning in some of these redistricting efforts um, and Joe Biden's favorability is down. But on the other hand, uh, Democrats have won almost every election that's come down to pro-choice uh, causes. And a lot of legislation has been moved forward um, due to abortion rights. And I was wondering how you think that um, a woman's right to choose is gonna factor into this upcoming election. Okay, let me put your question to a premise. Would you say abortion mattered in the last election? Yeah. I would agree with you. With that being the case, would you say New York and California are pro-life or pro-choice? Pro-choice. Okay. Why did Republicans win five more congressional seats in New York and the DCCC chair, the head of the Democratic Congressional Committee, who represents a district that's not Republican, his constituents are Soros and the Clintons. And we haven't beat a DCCC chair in 46 years. Why did they lose? And in California, why did we pick up seats in California and not lose any Republicans there? I mean, I have an answer. It's because those states are so far left, they don't believe that it's ever going to go away. Where abortion played greater were actually in red states. Um, I do believe it will matter because it will bring turnout. Um, it was based upon a Supreme Court decision. But that has distanced itself. So I think these cases will be in more selective in different states. Florida has an initiative on the ballot. And Florida, since the last election, has changed their law from 15 weeks to six weeks. So I do believe in certain areas it will be an issue. But I also believe it won't be the only issue. So the American public are going to weigh what affects them more personally um, from that. That's just my take. Good. Gentleman in the lodge, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Allison, uh, former Speaker McCarthy, for, uh, for this wonderful conversation. My name is uh, Alexander, and I am a senior at Harvard College. On the subject of principles, what has been the hardest moral decision that you have made during your career in politics? The hardest moral decision. You know, what's interesting, I, I was in the State House with Jeff Denham. He, he, he teaches here. He was a former member of Congress. And the one, one thing I want to brag about him is he has never served in a seat. He's a Republican. He's never served in a seat that's a Republican seat. He's always won in a Democrat seat that's been very difficult. And that's an easier job than where I served. I just had to win a primary. And um, he d he, he's done a great job. But when you're in the State House and then you go to Congress, there are some issues that are fundamentally different. And my first biggest issue, we were having this discussion earlier, was on the surge. So I get elected in 2006. Republicans lose the majority. And I would say the biggest issue there was about Iraq and the war. And I come in and um, the decision is I'm going to vote about the surge. And most people would sit back and think, oh, you're a Republican, you're just going to vote for it. And I, I probably would have thought that prior. But when you have before you a decision that you're going to put men and women in harm's way, and you knowingly know you're going to have to look a parent or a spouse in the eye that their loved one is not coming back, and you made a decision to put them there, you're going to have to have. And so I changed everything I did about it. I let everybody come in and talk to me from Code Pink to ambassadors in other countries who would privately tell me, we disagreed with you coming in, but we fundamentally disagree you leaving now. We think you have to have it. And it was a very difficult decision to make. But I voted for the surgeon. I 100% support my decision based upon the way I came about doing it. Um, are there some votes along the way? You know, there's great titles and names, and if I'd looked at it more, I could have gone either way with it. 
Yeah. But I look at my life. Look, I have lots of faults, but I wouldn't change one way because it makes who you are at the end of the day. Are there certain parts of my life I like myself better during that part of life? Yeah, but the, the, the tough part? Look, I think the most interesting part of somebody's life is when they stumble. Like you all sit here and you know me because I went through a lot of rounds to be speaker. Right? And then you know me, I'm the first one to get thrown out as speaker. Do you know in that vote being thrown out as speaker, I could have done it a whole other way. I could have made it simple, sweet, you just come in and put the thing and no one saw it. I made the decision, I'm going to make everybody stand up again. You know why? Because half the crowd in there lied to me, right? The Democrats for the last eight years have said they would never support a motion to vacate. Nancy Pelosi told me before I even walked in to get the final vote on the first speaker, accept that because we'll never let that happen. Democrats were in my office before. Republicans said it. And I just thought from the basis, if you're going to do it, then stand up and tell the American public. Do I have a lot of them who said they come back and tell me it's the worst vote I ever take? Yeah, but that's fine. You know? it's, it's who you make you. I think the most interesting part of your life is when you stumble is when you get back up. And this is the country that allows you to do it. Look, I'm young enough. I could stay out of politics 20 years and then run for the Senate and still be young. <laughs> I don't know if I can win in California, so I might have to move. I don't know. And if you wait another decade, you could run for president. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you. Here on the floor. Hello, and thank you for your time. My name is Hannah Freeman, and I do research for Boston Children's Hospital, but I am interested in science policy. Um, I would like to expand on some points brought up by the gentleman from Georgia about identity politics. It seems as if we have shifted more towards um, or away from the merit of the policies and in fact politicians and maybe even voters are afraid to agree with people across the aisle. Um, my question to you is what would you have to say to the next generation of people entering American politics on how to shift the rhetoric more towards the merit of policies rather than just the ideology of the party or the political party? Or is this a new era of American politics that we now need to embrace? All right. First of all, thank you for what you do. And I have actually called your hospital. I called Joe Kennedy off, a, off a skiing one time to get it just because I had somebody in my district that only your children's hospital could deal with and you, you were perfect and helped us. And there's, thank you. I, I think it's fabulous what you do. I don't have an easy answer for this because it's not just us, it's social media doing it to us. You know, I mean, if, if you look at my thread, it's going to be a lot of Australian shepherds, right? And different things. And, and, and it, it's only telling us what we want to know. And life gets so fast and it's harder for us to go out and find the other side. Um, I love this book called Think Again by Adam Grant. Because in the book, it takes this premise that I come to a position as an elected official, and I, I support this position, and I, and I campaign on it. But I do it based upon the knowledge that I have and the experience that I have. But what if I find out later there's this whole other more information that I had not known before, and I change my position? You're going to call me a flip-flopper. I'm going to sit back and say, no, I think it's the intellectually right thing to do. So I would tell young people, no matter what position you have, challenge yourself at it. Let, have the other side come in. But you've got to start having these discussions where you can disagree and you can respect their position. Look, I don't know what it's like to grow up as a woman. I don't know what it's like to grow up as Hispanic or black, you know? And I, I can't assume all those experience to be pulled over from that, you know? And so I've got to be more open. And, and it's hard to do because it's the experience with you. I don't know what it's like to live in a Jewish family, right? But I want to go break bread. I want to understand it. Um, and I just think it takes more time. But we get so busy in everything else we do, we don't, we don't value our pressure to do that. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, speaker, professor, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. My name is Michael Ovid. I'm the chair of the Conservative Coalition at the Institute of Politics, and I'm the president of the Harvard Republican Club. My question to you is, given the experience that you have and um, you know, all the knowledge that you've accumulated throughout the years, if you can implement three policies now to put America on a better trajectory for the future, what three would they be? 
Take away the motion to vacate by one person in the house. <laughs> and then we would take away the two votes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's been around for a long time. Um, you know, everybody thinks money and politics drives. I've always felt I want the power to go back to the district. And districts cost different money. And I don't know that you could do it, but I, I would do this if, if, if it was legal. How do I empower the district more? Because what it would do would empower me to be in the district more, right? And a voter has more power, but you want to be equal. Trees don't vote, people vote. So could I say, I can't take a dollar from outside the district till I get a dollar inside the district, right? So now I'm down, you all live in my district, so I'm going to catch all these dollars here, so I'll go get you to give me two, right? But it's also, if a district is very expensive, another, they're going to give more, so you can balance it out. Um, I like competition. Now we have the fewest number of competitive seats in Congress. So you look at 30 members of Congress who really everything rests upon. It doesn't matter how they vote, there's a press release that, you know, They've done, they voted the wrong way. And all the money is compounded upon them. And then when we say people leaving, right, the, the good people not. Um, when I came into Congress, I, I'm a person who believes structure dictates behavior. So l let me tell you three things I did as speaker that you will think, oh, that's kind of stupid, right? The first thing I instituted was no longer did members of Congress have to walk through a magnetometer to go into the chambers, which only they can serve in. Because what's in your mind? And if you walk in and it goes off, you're fined $5,000. It's a lot of money to a member of Congress. Well, the first thing, if it's only us as members walk in and we have to walk through a magnetometer, the first thing it tells me is, I don't trust you or you. Well, that's the wrong place to be. I would say bills had to go through committee. So, so you, when I became speaker for the first time in seven years, and think about that, for the entire time that Paul Ryan was speaker and Nancy Pelosi was speaker, no bill came to the floor with an open rule. Now, what does that mean? You think bills come to the floor and any member can offer an amendment. Just because you don't serve on the committee, you still have people in your district who care about it, but you don't have a voice, so then you get mad. When I became speaker, we had the first time in seven years a bill that was wide open. That should be the basics, right? Um, so I created movie night, okay? This is why I came And I said, members can come and they can bring one person. You want to know why I tell you to invite a person? Because you're going to invite somebody pretty special back home. You're going to behave a little different. And you know what happens when you invite somebody back home? They want to meet people that they see on TV, so they don't care what party you're in. And you're going to interact. So what I did, I picked the movie we were going to watch. And it wasn't a brand new movie. We're going to watch Lincoln, OK? But we're not going to go to Lincoln first. In my office, I brought the Library of Congress brought all this exhibit from Lincoln. They have this box of everything that was in his pockets the night he died. He had a, he had a $5 Confederate bill because he had been to Richmond. He had two pairs of glasses, but he was a conservative, so they were broken, and he put his own twine together to hold them together, right? Um, and we do these writings of Lincoln in his handwriting, right? It's powerful. And so you would see that, and, and your guests would interact, right? And you know that's interesting? Every Democrat guest wanted a picture with me, right? Because they see me on TV. And I'll guarantee you, they walked away and said, He's a lot nicer in person, right? And then before we watch the movie, we go into theater inside Congress, which we never show a movie. I have Doris Goodwin. Why? She's not one of my partners. She's a Democrat. She wrote The Team of Rivals. The whole movie is based upon her book. But her book is much bigger than the movie. The whole movie is about the 13th Amendment, OK? And it's about Lincoln literally slowing down the Civil War victory because he's got to get the 13th Amendment passed because the Emancipation Proclamation won't sustain itself and the, the war will be for naught. And he can't just have his own party vote for it, but some of his own parties against him. He's got his own Freedom Caucus going, you're right, trying to stop it. And then he's got to get Democrats at the same time. And at the same time that he's debating and making this argument, he's not being forthright. If they ask him, well, this 13th Amendment, does this mean you're going to allow black Americans to vote? Oh, no, 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 no. But he knows that's where that goes. But he can only move the country so far. And what I wanted to have happen here, so we have this whole discussion before the movie starts. And then we watch this movie. 
And then tomorrow we're going to walk onto the floor. And you know the chambers we walk into in that floor? Is exactly where the 13th Amendment debate happened and was passed. So all this other crap we argue about that doesn't matter to try to rise people up. Then I had planned a carnival on the front of the Capitol. I had, I had the Ferris wheel. I had the kids' games, right? And you're going to bring your family. What happens? Your family starts interacting. The kids don't care what party they're in. But then we we're going to do games like at a carnival, right? But it wouldn't be Republican versus Democrat. It was one committee versus another. Because what happens? The Republican and the committee are working together to compete against the other. And subliminal, they don't realize they can do that. I mean, I think the system was so broken after COVID. And in COVID, members didn't even have to show up to vote anymore. It was only started, I was opposed to it. Nancy Pelosi put it in because she believed that, you know, if you had COVID, you're afraid to come. But what happens was somebody had some movie star got married in France. They were there. Somebody was voting from a boat. And then you weren't interacting. There were more votes by COVID by, by proxy than actually there. And if you don't interact with each other, you don't know each other. And so from that premise, um, creating the structure to be different. And then what I tried to do when I became speaker, prior to becoming speaker, there's three big macro issues that I'm worried about. We have a lot of problems. Our debt. Our debt's going to hit us in the next seven years. This is the first time we paid more in interest than we spent on our defense. It just happened last time, OK? The education system in America. To me, it's the great equalizer. We're failing. China. He wrote a book about it. So when I, there's a couple things I did. AI and quantum. A lot of countries are trying to capture it. Before I became, I was just leader, I brought 10 members. No disrespect here, but MIT has a course. They, take, they, they teach every general in our military on AI and quantum. So I took 10 members, we went there, and I had them develop a course for Congress. And lots of times, we'll write a bill, but we're opposed to it because the other side. So what I would do when it becomes these big issues, the only time we as Congress come together like this is if we get a classified briefing. Okay. So I decided I was going to start bringing us all together for big issues before we write it. And we're going to make it equal sides. And we're just going to start talking about it as a family so you don't oppose it when you first start, right? And um, then I had the courses built where I brought MIT to start teaching us about AI and about quantum. So look, at Congress knows about this much about every subject, right? They're not experts in a lot, but we need to raise the bar. So how can I raise the bar of the members who come to serve and the intellectual knowledge that they have on these tough issues? Um, and the last thing, when it came to China, I created a select committee on China. And I want you to understand why. I got the idea at the 75th anniversary of Normandy. And I was literally with Speaker Pelosi. And we were walking the grave sites. It's unbelievable. When you look at the names, all these men are about the same age. Different faiths, Star of David, Cross. And they all died about the same time. And you think, as a policymaker, what could people in your position have done that that day never happened? Well, if I read Destined for War, I know only four times of the 16 through the Sicilius trap, it didn't happen. So what can I do? Because those policymakers, it wouldn't be the week before, the year before, it'd be the decade before. So I, I went to Pelosi at the time and said, let's create a committee that's close in numbers so it's not partisan. Let's both decide like, who to be on the committee. And it took me eight months. She said yes, but then COVID happened. She didn't want to do it. So what I did, I decided I'm going to treat Hakeem Jeffries the way I wanted to be treated. So I brought him, before I told my own conference, I said, these are the members I want to appoint to this committee based upon who they are. So you saw, I'm not playing games. This is serious. And I want you to appoint the same. And to his credit, he did. And with the Intel Committee, I said, anybody on this Intel Committee is going to have to go to MIT for three days to learn about quantum. But they have to do it together, Republican and Democrat. And when we install the new 
Intel Committee, I want you with me, Hakeem Jeffries, to talk to all of them together to tell them this isn't a place for politics. And if they have a question, they could go to you or they can go to me. It doesn't matter what party you're in because this is too important. And to this credit, a year ago, when the president of Taiwan came to America, I didn't want to make it something that gave me notoriety. I want to make it something that's important. So I called this man. The first place I picked was where would we hold it. I wasn't going to go there because I didn't want to get involved in the elections because they were having elections coming up. So I picked the Reagan Library, not because of Republican, but the symbolism of the big Ber Berlin Wall of us overcoming communism, OK? Then, to the Democrats' credit, on that committee, they all came. And we did this press conference outside 150 cameras. Andrea Mitchell was there. And to the Democrats' credit as well, Trump gets indicted that day. So they're like, I got to stand up with you. I know what the press is going to ask. I said, no. I will not allow the press to ask one of those questions. I'm going to tell them up front, I will not answer that. This is not the day and this is not the place. And they stood with me. And Andrea Mitchell stands there and Andrea Mitchell says this, and we have the Berlin Wall behind us. Republicans and Democrats are like, we just met with the President of Taiwan. She says, you know, I was at the Berlin Wall when Reagan made that famous cloud, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I am just as emotional today by seeing both of you there standing on this issue. Now, how many of you even heard that? Or knew of that. That was both of us working well together on what I think is a one of the major issues we have coming forward. And I'm, if there's another legacy, it would be the Select Committee on China, what they've been able to produce together. And, and it's not about preparing for war; it's about not being dependent on war. Oh, we could go on all evening, except we're supposed to stop. The folks are here saying 7 o'clock, cut, cut, cut. So working rules, we went over slightly, but what a fantastic class and opportunity. And I think, Kevin, you can see we're a pretty receptive audience, so I hope we can persuade you to come back again. Let's say thank you very much. Thank you.